time, and so let's go ahead and begin our show. I'm Mike Shanahan, I'm the Planetarium Director at Liberty Science Center, and our program is Get Ready for the Mars Landing, as we preview the landing of per Perseverance on the Red Planet. Now before we get going, a few things to note. Uh, first of all, we do have the other two Planetarium staff members, Krista and Andrew, in the chat. If you have astronomy questions, they'll be addressing those during our program. We'll leave a few minutes at the end of our half hour long program also at the end to uh, address any of the questions that come up about the Red Planet or other astronomy. Liberty Science Center, as I was mentioning, got these programs going during the great closure, but the popularity of our online programs was so great that we kept these going once a month, even although our main facility is now open again. We are open four days a week. Uh, this coming President's Day weekend, we're actually open all, uh, on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and also Tuesday, an unusual day for us to be open. We are normally open Thursday through uh, Sundays. Now, if you want to come and see us, the great news is that the planetarium is also open whenever we're open, shows every hour. The folks that you see giving these programs online are the same folks delivering programming at the planetarium. The also good news, but as a heads up, we're popular enough that we're selling out our shows a lot. So if you want to come and see us, I would suggest going and booking online at the main Liberty Science Center site to, to book the show that you want to catch. A couple of exciting things coming up here during this upcoming President's Day weekend. We have a big focus on superhero programming as we come to the last two weeks of our superhero exhibit. So we want to do more superhero science. Come and join us for this weekend. Now, this is an unusual day for our online presence because we actually have two separate programs in terms of our online programming, Facebook Live today. At 7 o'clock, we have a special Valentine's Facebook uh, Live trivia program. I should mention that's for intended for ages 18 and up. But if you want to join us for that, we're giving away some prizes for that. So first time for that. So we hope we'll see you in the dome. I also wanted to mention that the only real way to donate, first of all, there's no cost for this program, but if you did want to support us, there's a little red Liberty Science Center button. That's the one true way to donate if you wanted to support the programming that we're offering. The popularity and demand was so high, we currently have nearly 800 folks watching us, that we figured we were going to keep this going once a month, even as we open our mothership. One last thing to mention, uh, we're taking the same software that we use in the main dome called Digistar and putting it on your home screens. Designed originally for a 90-foot diameter dome, the biggest dome in the Western Hemisphere. It's my way of saying that if you can make your image on your home screen as big as possible, you'll probably get the most out of the program that way. If you go for full screen, for example, you get more of that appeal. So that being said, we're now going to go ahead and go and begin our show where all astronomy has its origins as we explore where to find Mars in the sky before we head off and view Mars close up the way that NASA sees the planet. And we're going to go ahead and begin our program by going back to September. So here's the sky you would have seen just before the first light of dawn in September of 2020. And our first mission is to figure out how to find Mars in the sky. Mars is just a dot of light. Like all the thousands of stars you can see on a good dark night. And yet Mars and the other planets were special enough that the Greeks and Romans, for example, named them after the most important thing they could think of, the gods and goddesses of their culture. So we're going to try to find Mars by trying to figure out how Mars differs from those hundreds of stars that we see here on a September morning just before daybreak. Now, those stars and planets are both just dots of light. There are some differences. For example, Mars is known as the red planet. That is not quite correct. Mars is, in fact, the pale orange planet, but it does have a distinctive orangey glow to it. On the other hand, there's other objects out there, other stars that have an orangey glow too. So that will get us some way, but won't completely lead us to finding Mars. It's often said that planets don't twinkle like stars do. And that is because 
planets are so much closer than stars. So Mars is maybe 100,000 times closer to us than the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. So when starlight finally hits our atmosphere after a long voyage, it's easily twinkled by our atmosphere. Planets being closer, even though they only shine by reflecting the light of the sun, have a steadier beam. Planets are often bright. So Venus, Jupiter, always bright whenever they're in the sky. And Mars also last uh, year was quite blazing away, especially in the fall. But the distinctive thing about planets is that they move against the starry background in contrast to, for example, Orion. So here we have the famous Orion constellation already visible in the pre-dawn sky in September. And this constellation was named roughly 2,500 years ago, and yet we can still use this term today because the stars are so far away that they're like cars on a really distant freeway. It takes a long time to tell they're moving. So you won't find Bellatrix here going off this way next month, and Saif is not going to wander over this way. So we can actually use these ancient terms nowadays. But planets being more like a car zipping on in front of your apartment or your house, we can tell they're moving pretty quickly. Not as you look at them. If you're seeing a thing move as you look at it, you're seeing either a satellite or an airplane. But over the course of a month, you can see a planet is changing its position. The very word planet comes from planetes, which is a Greek word for wanderer. So our job here at the beginning of the program is to try to find some good possible candidates for Mars based on brightness and color and to see if any of these are moving against the starry background as we go forward a month. Now, we'll put on one more constellation as a reference. Here's a pretty faint one. One of the signs of the zodiac, Pisces the fish, again, the stars in Pisces haven't really moved visibly in a couple thousand years, so we can still use that term. Now, I know a lot of things about astronomy. I don't really know why these two fish are tied together with a ribbon, but there we have it. So we're going to just find a few good candidates for Mars. Take a moment and scan the skies. We're looking for bright dots of light that have an orange color to them. Just take a moment. I'll go ahead and label some good Mars candidates. So A, kind of note where that is. I'm making it easy on you for A because it's against the left-hand ribbon of the fish. B, you may want to notice how it makes a nice triangle with this star and that star. C, makes a nice right triangle with this and that star. D's not near any bright stars, but we can maybe make a triangle there. So we're going to be going forward in time, one month, to the 1st of October. And your mission is to figure out if any of these orangey dots of light have moved against the starry background. Let's go ahead and just go out on October 1, try to find the same orangey dots in the sky. How time flies. So here we are, October 1. Take a moment, scan the skies. Can you tell if any of these have moved? You may want to notice also that the moon, which is actually a little speed demon, has joined us again. The moon is the fastest moving natural object in the sky. It goes around the sky once every 30 days. In fact, for the Greeks, the moon was also a planet because it did the important thing that planets do. It moved. So maybe a little hard to tell, let's put our labeling back on, these are conveniences our ancestors didn't have, and put on our Pisces the fish outline as well to tell, have any of these moved? You know, maybe it's me, but it seems like A has gone from a left-hand ribbon to the right-hand ribbon. If the other dots are moving, they're moving very slowly because it's not obvious there's been much change in their position. So let's go, just one more observation, to the 1st of November. By then, if these things are moving, it should be pretty obvious that they've moved. So here we are, November 1. So if you check, yeah, definitely A is moving. A has gone all the way in, in two months from this left-hand ribbon to being outside of the right-hand ribbon. And you may notice another change. 
This one has increased dramatically in brightness. This is, in fact, the planet Mars, and it's where you would have seen Mars in the morning sky if you've been observing it in September and October and November. And the other three are red or orange-colored stars, Betelgeuse and Orion, Aldebaran and Taurus, and Deneb Kaitos in Cetus the Whale. So if we want to observe this motion from November 1 and take it to today's date so I can show you where to find Mars tonight, I want you to notice also that Mars was really, really bright back in November, the brightest it's been in two years. And watch what happens to that brightness as we now do a time lapse to take us to the actual position of Mars this very evening at 6 p.m. here on September 11. Apparently the fish were captured by a string, so they won't escape from each other. You ever tried to tie a line on a fish? As Krista filling in a little bit of Pisces lore. Notice as we go forward, by the way, that Mars is dropping in brightness substantially. It was blazingly bright, brighter than the planet Jupiter, which is the second brightest sky dot most of the time. And tonight, it's still fairly bright, so here's what you'd see uh, if you wait till the show is over. This is exactly what you see walking outside of your house or apartment if you're lucky enough to have clear skies. So it is, uh, Mars is now zero magnitude, which is still really bright, but it's actually now in the same range of brightness as a couple of those other bright stars that were near it, bright stars that were our other Mars candidates. So we have both uh, the orangey stars, Betelgeuse and Orion, and uh, Aldebaran in the bullseye. But this is actually worth kind of checking out. If you go out tonight, you have this arc of three orange dots, the one on the right being Mars, all of about the same brightness right now. And also down below there, you can also catch the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, which wasn't as bright as Mars when Mars peaked out, but now Sirius is clearly going to shine brighter than Mars. So this is one of the things about Mars that's really striking and ties into why we have three launches to Mars in the same period. And that is because Mars is, first of all, small, so it's not a great reflector of light. And its distance to us varies dramatically. So if we start our observation of Mars from above the solar system. Here we are, Thursday the 14th, 2019. So this is like 15 months and a million years ago. Let's watch what happens between these two as we get the clock rolling. Earth and Mars are 230 million miles apart back in November of 2019. But Earth on the inside track is moving faster than Mars and slowly catching up. So no matter what we were doing in this absolutely tumultuous year of 2020, night by night, Mars was getting brighter and brighter as Earth got closer and closer to it until you got into the fall and had that blazing dot that we saw in the November skies. And then also, if your plan is to launch a rocket to Mars, you want to do it when there's not 230 million miles separating our two planets, but only about 40 million miles. And so when you have these times of close gathering of Mars and Earth, you have Mars really bright in the sky, and you usually send off at least one, or in this case, three missions to the red planet, taking advantage of that close, closeness. So that's why both we had this incredibly bright orangey dot in the sky all through the fall, and we, while we now have three missions arriving at the red planet. Now, maybe because Mars had a color that reminded folks of blood, or fire at least, long ago Mars became connected with the god of war. The term martial, as in martial arts, comes from Mars. The Romans especially were very impressed by Mars and named the month of March, the originally, the, originally the first month of their calendar after this very important god. The idea continued into medieval and renaissance times that Mars was both a dangerous symbol as a planet in astrology and also someone who presided over combat. When the telescope came along in 1609, when Galileo invented it, or at least used it for astronomy for the first time, Mars was baffling 
In September 1610, Galileo looked at the planet Mars and saw nothing. He saw a tangerine, basically, in the eyepiece. He could see no features at all. And so although Galileo made wonderful discoveries about Jupiter and Saturn and Venus, he was uh, baffled and a little frustrated by the planet Mars. His telescope wasn't very good. But in the ensuing years of the 17th century, when being a telescope maker could become a full-time job, very quickly telescopes got really good. And by the 1650s, this gentleman, Christian Huygens, uh, uh, was able to, for the first time in history, observe a feature on the planet Mars. And that feature we know now is called Sirtis Major, the great plane on Mars, S-Y-R-T-I-S. And by getting a feature on Mars in his telescope, Huygens was also able to watch how long it took for it to come back around, and by so doing, he was able to figure out how long a day was on the planet Mars. And it turns out a day on Mars is 24 hours and 37 minutes, so very close to a day on Earth. One of many things that implied that Mars and Earth had a lot in common, a lot more than most other planets. So telescopes get better and better. Uh, this gentleman, Percival Lowell, in the late 19th century became obsessed by Mars. He had money. He, his family actually is the family who gave its name to Lowell, Massachusetts. He was able to move to Arizona and build a telescope to observe Mars in the clear Arizona air. And night by night, observing Mars, making little sketches of it. Here's what Lowell saw on the surface of the red planet. He saw canals, he saw hundreds of lines on the Martian surface, and he did not mince words. He believed Mars was the home of a highly advanced civilization, but Mars was drying up. That's why it was the color of the desert. And so in literally a last ditch effort, the Martians had built canals from the polar caps to the main cities near the equator to bring water to the Martian hubs of civilization. Now, funnily enough, uh, Lowell believed that Martians had to be peaceable because these canals were straight. In other words, they didn't go around national boundaries. So clearly all of Mars had grouped together to rescue their planet. But still, if you think about it, if you think of Mars meaning warfare and aggression, it's not a big leap to go from the peaceful Martians of Lowell in, say, expressed in in the year uh, 1893, to a much different version of what Martians be, might be like in the novel War of the Worlds, published by H.G. Wells in the year 1898 in novel form. So in this novel, the uh, Martians come to England. Uh, they don't move very well in the high gravity of Earth, so they rely upon three-legged war machines. And they have heat rays, kind of a predecessor to lasers, which of course had not been invented in 1898. And nothing the human race can throw at these, Martians can stop them. The human race appears to be doomed, but then the Martians catch the common cold. They had never been exposed to earthly bacteria, bacteria, and that wipes out the Martians when nothing that the humans toss at them can stop them. So that was 1898, fast forward 40 years. So in October 30 of 1938, a young man named Orson Welles, no relation to H.G., was dramatizing famous novels on the radio in the Mercury Theater of the Air. And he was concerned that this old, dusty novel by H.G. Wells would bore people. So he had this idea to tell the story of War of the Worlds in a series of news flashes as if it was really happening. So he had the Martians land in Grover Mill, New Jersey, of all places, and take over the Northeast from there. And of the folks who heard that broadcast, maybe a million believed that Martians had landed that night. Now, if he had talked about invaders from Neptune, it's not likely that we would have panicked here in New Jersey, but Mars has always been a place that suggests that it's an abode of life and possibly a home of aggressive Martians. So vivid hold that Mars has on the human imagination has laid the groundwork for us to continue to wonder in the space age about whether Mars might be an abode of life. We no longer fear Martians, 
but we want to become Martians someday. So Mars, as we know it in the space age, is a fascinating world. It does have two little moons, Phobos and Deimos, which mean fear and terror, kind of going back to that idea of Mars being a war god. Mars does have polar caps, as Huygens had noticed as well, and they change with the seasons. And Mars actually does have seasons, unlike a place like Venus. And as the seasons change, we sometimes have dust storms that can blanket the entire planet. Two and a half years ago, the last close approach, the whole planet was blanked out with a dust storm. Or sometimes it'll, the changing seasons will bring us little Martian tornadoes. Now, if you know the Elton John song, Rocket Man, Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids. In fact, it's cold as heck. Generally around 80 to 100 degrees below zero, further from the sun, and Mars also lacks a thick atmosphere to serve as a blanket. The air is 100 times as thin as the air on Earth, but the result of it is carbon dioxide primarily. And yet this world has got amazing features. So here we have giant mountains, including Mount Olympus, Olympus Mons. Someone mentioned that in the chat. And the other tall mountains of the Tharsis Range, each one over twice the height of Mount Everest. And Mars has giant chasms, no canals, I should mention. Those canals were optical illusions. They never existed. But there is one really long chasm, Mariner Valley, that is... 3,000 miles long and four miles deep. That's about the only canal we have on Mars, and it's not human-made or Martian-made. It's a great crack in the crust caused by a Mars quake. Now, here's why it's kind of amazing that Mars has these big features. Mars is really little, half the size of Earth, and that makes a big difference. Being small, the gravity on Mars is low. If you weighed 100 pounds on Earth, you weigh 38 pounds on Mars. With low gravity, Mars couldn't hold a thick atmosphere. And without a thick atmosphere, Mars couldn't hold on to liquid water. And that is an interesting evolution because there's a lot of evidence from our space missions that Mars was an ocean planet like Earth billions of years ago. But Mars dried up. So did life get going on Mars when it was wet and then die off as Mars dried out? Well, that's a really important, intriguing question that we need to explore, and I'm going to explore with his upcoming mission. So two worlds, a lot in common, and a lot that's really different, side by side. So I mentioned in passing that Mars does have seasons, so Mars is actually tilted very much like the Earth is. 25 degrees for Mars, 23 and a half for Earth, which does mean that the seasons change significantly as our planets go around the sun. Venus being upright, one of many reasons why Venus has no seasons to speak of. So the predecessor in many ways for the Perseverance mission is this mission called Curiosity, which landed in 2012 and really added to our body of evidence that Mars had tons of water back in ancient times. And again, we're talking three billion years ago. There's evidence of lakes and of catastrophic flooding and so this mission not only assembled a lot of that data about Mars being a wet planet, but the design of Curiosity is being recycled in the design for the Perseverance mission. Now, in between, we had this mission called InSight, which landed a couple of years ago, which is more of a geology mission monitoring for Mars quakes, not primarily a mission focused on taking images, but Cameras are just so freaking good nowadays that here's a picture from InSight that gives you a beautiful sense of the true colors of the Martian landscape. So InSight, 2018, and now we're getting ready for the Perseverance mission coming in for a landing a week from today, almost exactly a week from right now. We see the rover Perseverance being assembled its tires are more substantial than the ones on Curiosity, but outside of that, the design is very similar to Curiosity. Uh, this rover is going to move more quickly. It's the fastest moving rover, so it needs those big wheels. Now, it's hard enough to send a mission from here 100 million miles to the Red Planet, but imagine doing all of that in the middle of the COVID crisis. So for all three of the missions from China, 
from the United Arab Emirates and from the uh, NASA, they had to do the final preparations and the launch right smack in the middle of the COVID crisis. This plaque is on board Perseverance. It's a, a homage to medical workers, the medical staff with the globe of Earth on top of it, and then showing the takeoff from Cape Canaveral and then heading off to the planet Mars. So as they got ready to pack the mission away, if you look in this next image here, you can maybe see the wheels of the rover. This is the last chance they're gonna see daylight until they're right above Mars when that cowling comes off. They all loaded it up and launched it from Florida. There is only a two week window to take off or they would have to wait two more years until the lineup was just right again. But fortunately at exactly the first moment of the window opening up on the 30th of July. Conditions were great in Florida, and off it went on its seven plus month, vo month voyage to the Red Planet. So all three of the missions that are heading for Mars all launched in the second half of July. And uh, this was the third of the launches. So fairly close, seven month trip or so, when you do your launching when Mars is nicely lined up the way it was here last year. And this is going to go straight on in. So Perseverance is not going to orbit and land like Viking did, for example, back in the 70s. It is going straight on in. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So this is why we know exactly when the landing is going to be. It's going to be just after 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time, on the 18th of February, a week from today. And the site selected is the most difficult, but one of the more intriguing sites that have been selected for a, a rover landing. It's called Jezero Crater. And Jezero is a Slavic word meaning lake because this was a lake billions of years ago. This lake is, uh, the actual edge of a lake is there. If you see where the kind of the cliffs are now. So all this area in here is the lake itself. And there's actually a river flowing into the lake and a delta that was on the bottom of the lake, hundreds of feet below the surface of the lake. So it seemed like a really rich environment to land a spacecraft. In a muddy delta like we're looking at directly, this might be a great location for life to, at least in sort of microscopic form, to have it, uh, gotten going on ancient Mars. We see in greater relief here to point out a couple of the elements here. This again, this cliff where my arrow is, that is the edge of the ancient lake. Here is the delta, again, which is at the bottom of the ancient lake, and then a river that would uh, bring material into the delta. So this is the area they're choosing to land in. They can only do it because the skill sets they have now to land on Mars are so far beyond what we had in past landings. It's still going to be, as they say, a seven-minute ride of terror for those back on Earth as they're waiting for news about the landing as it goes out of uh, contact. Coming in on the 18th, Mars does have some air, so that will help to slow the, the descent. Uh, parachutes, uh, one parachute that's about 70 feet in diameter will slow the descent as it comes over Mars. And then in the third part of the braking, there will also be rockets used to... Uh, help with the final stage of the descent. So it hits the atmosphere at 12,000 miles an hour, and it has to be going 1.5 miles an hour at the very end as it touches down. And the cowling will pull away, and we'll have perseverance there on the surface. So I've been through a few uh, landing-type experiences. So NASA is hoping to get some at least raw imagery back right after landing. With Curiosity, at my last museum, we had a viewing party, and within 20 minutes, we got the first pictures. So I'm hoping that'll be the case here again. This has to communicate up to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is gonna be ducking below the horizon uh, shortly after landing. So we're hoping to get some images up to the spacecraft and then beam back to Earth to get some imagery at least by uh, within an hour or so of landing. However, this is going to be on Thursday, a week from today, and more and more great material is going to come out on Friday and especially over the, that following weekend. 
including video. Again, we're in a camera-heavy age. There's so many great cameras on spacecraft now. They're going to have video even looking at the ground as the spacecraft does come in for the landing. So over that weekend, so I'm thinking probably the 19th, the 20th, the 21st, look for a lot of great more material coming out. But look for, hopefully, uh, at least a few good shots from the surface on the actual evening of the landing itself. So this is largely based on the chassis of Curiosity, that last mission, but it has 40% more science experiments than any past mission. Over here in this side is a really interesting experiment called MOXIE, which is going to try to convert Martian air, which is mainly carbon dioxide, into oxygen, to break up CO2 and use the O, the oxygen, because of course oxygen is both vital for animals to breathe and is also needed for rocket fuel. So for future human missions, it's going to be so incredibly helpful if we can extract oxygen out of the Martian atmosphere. So everything we're doing here, everything that's uh, being done by the UAE mission and by the Chinese mission has one eye on prepping the way for eventual human missions to the Red Planet. Again, the camera technology on Perseverance is a whole new level than past missions. And here is the, one of the other really great things about this mission. It's going to collect samples of the Martian soil. Now, drilling in Mars can be really problematic. The last mission, InSight, had some real challenges trying to bore down into the landing, into the area around its landing site. But in this case, uh, Perseverance is going to collect samples of Martian soil about the size of your finger and then put them inside these hermetically sealed containers in a little clean room here, uh, about the cleanest facility the human race has ever invented. And the soil will be stored in these little yellow modules that you see here. And here's the amazing thing. Eventually, Perseverance will take these yellow containers of Martian uh, soil, eject them on the surface of Mars, not because it's a litter bug, because a whole other mission is going to come along, collect these samples, take them to Mars orbit, where another mission will take them back to Earth in an actual Martian sample return. You can learn far more about Mars if you can analyze Mars in a laboratory on Earth. So it may be about 10 years before these samples actually get back to Earth. The folks running this mission right now are designing a mission in part with an eye on future scientists 10 or 20 years down the road who will have access to these samples returned from the surface of Mars. So that is a really exciting, it's a joint endeavor between NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency. Now the other thing that you may have heard about already is the first helicopter ever designed for another world. So Ingenuity, which will be stored in the belly of Perseverance will be the first helicopter designed for any foreign land, any other world. Now, it's got to spin pretty quickly in the thin air of Mars, but it's helpful that the gravity is so low. And here again, we're testing out technologies that could revolutionize how we explore other worlds. So back in 1997, we had a little tiny, like a child's toy, rover called Sojourner. But that tested out the idea of a rover that has led to four amazing NASA rovers on Mars. And who knows, a helicopter as well, the concept being tested out, could very well revolutionize how we explore other worlds robotically. The early phases of Perseverance are going to involve really testing out a lot of the technology. And so because of that, it's going to be mainly tested in the first month or so, this idea of a helicopter for a foreign world. So, that is a Perseverance mission. However, that is not, of course, the only mission heading off to Mars. There are two other missions that both, hooray, hooray, went into orbit over the last couple of days. So the Martian uh, mission from China, uh, Tianwen, means celestial questions. It's actually an ancient poem uh, from China. Uh, launched on a heavy lift vehicle back in July 
And it is a three-part mission. So it has an orbiter that will then drop a lander, which will then send a rover down to the surface. And so the good news is that this mission did arrive yesterday. It is now in orbit. It's going to wait three months until it actually sends the lander and the rover down to the surface. So this orbiter will observe Mars, of course, and then when the lander and rover come in, they'll have a very similar landing approach to what Perseverance has, using air braking and a parachute and rockets to land itself on the Martian surface. And then once down, the rover will be deployed to explore the area around the landing. And so again, the really good news is that that mission did arrive in orbit yesterday and seems to be functioning just fine and dandy. The day before the Chinese mission arrived, so two days ago, back on Tuesday, the mission from the United Arab Emirates became the first mission from an Arabic country to go into orbit around Mars. So this was launched by a Japanese rocket from a Japanese launch facility in southern Japan. Also launched in July and also took about seven months to get from Earth to the Red Planet. And this mission is primarily an orbiting mission focused on understanding more about the weather and the atmosphere of Mars. So every piece of information that these various missions bring to the table can help to further pave the way for the grand adventure of the first human mission to the planet Mars. So yeah, very good pair of news is that uh, two separate pieces of good news. This one here called Hope from the United Arab Emirates arrived on Tuesday into orbit. The Chinese mission Tianwan-1 arrived yesterday. And they'll both help us to understand more about the planet because we explore Mars in part because it's a fascinating world that may have harbored life in ancient time, but we also explore Mars, Mars selfishly as human beings because we want to go there someday. And every piece of information that a robot collects can be applied towards planning the first Martian mission that has human beings on board. We don't know how long it's going to be. There is hope as soon as the 2030s and maybe the 2040s it is a really complicated undertaking. So folks often think of a Mars human mission as in the same category as going to the, um, the moon with the Apollo mission, missions. But with Apollo, uh, the moon is so close, a quarter million miles away, that you can go to the moon and back in two weeks. That's how long your average Apollo mission was. But Mars, on average, maybe 100 million miles away, you have to not only go there, which takes seven months, but then you got to wait for Mars and Earth, as we saw in our diagram earlier in the show, to line up again close to each other before you begin your return trip to Earth. And so you're going to be gone on a Mars mission for between two and three years, maybe a thousand days you're going to be gone from Earth. So the level of difficulty is far beyond the challenges of the Apollo mission. But it is the one planet that we have any chance really of getting a human being to in this century. Venus is too hostile. The other planets are too far away. And so after we return to the moon, which will, one hopes will happen fairly soon, the next logical step is to look at going to the planet Mars with the first human mission. So uh, that is the moment of hope that we're looking at. So far, things have gone well with both the missions that have arrived in orbit. Things seem to be nominal in terms of the arrival of Perseverance, and they're all going to help us lay the groundwork for the first human missions to Mars. And so that brings us to the end of the formal program. I'm going to check, though, and see if we have some questions that we want to address. I wanted to mention, as we're wrapping up, a couple of things. Again, there's that round donate button if you want to support Liberty Science Center. That's the only true way to do that. We do have, for those 18 and over, the Valentine's trivia question at 7 o'clock tonight. And our next program for Planetarium Online goes back to our regular time on the first Thursday at 5 o'clock. And Krista on our team will be talking, appropriately enough, about the future of human spaceflight. So thank you again for joining us. That ends the formal program. And I'll check to see if we have some questions we can address before we wrap up our program. So Becky is wondering how long does it take to get messages from Mars to Earth? These messages back and forth 
travel at the speed of light. So it really depends on how far away Mars is. But something like 20 minutes each direction is a good average amount of getting a message to, from Earth to Mars at the light speed. Checking out other questions we have here. Thank you all for the positive comments. And uh, we also, uh, on site, our planetarium program, which is called, we have one show called uh, Planets Tonight, where we give updates on the Mars mission and other things going on with the planets. I didn't mention earlier, but right now, if you're trying to find a planet in the sky tonight, your only choice is Mars, unless you have a telescope good enough to see the planet Uranus, which is very close to Mars in the sky. So if you want to see Jupiter or Saturn, you're going to have to wait until the end of March. And for Venus, you're going to have to wait all the way until May. So Mars is, is it in terms of planets we can see easily. So go and enjoy that. And we aren't really going to be going to... Uh, so we're going to be losing Mars only in, in July. By then, it's going to be really faint as we pull further and further away from that. Uh, Daniel's wondering, does Mars' color come primarily from the iron in its crust? Yes, so Mars is essentially a rusty planet. Iron oxide gives Mars that distinctive red color. Yeah, and how long does it take to get to Mars? So we're taking advantage of a really pretty close approach here. But that's really how it goes. If you look down through the history of Mars missions, there's always about two years between them because of that lineup every two years, or to be exact, every 26 months being just right for getting to Mars as quickly as possible. I wanted to mention also that uh, Andrew and Krista and I have been doing these programs for a long time now. Uh, we began doing them when we first closed back in April. And if you go to LSC in the house off of our main LSC page, all the shows we've ever done are in fact available as YouTube videos on our main homepage. If you're intrigued more, if you want to learn more, for example, about the War of the World's Panic, that radio play that put a number of us New Jerseyites into panic, uh, I wasn't in New Jersey yet, or even born yet, but in 1938, uh, there was that War of the World's Panic. We have a whole show on why it is that that one radio broadcast about Martian invaders put people into such a panic. And we have, uh, if you're interested in astrology, we did have a whole show on astrology, a couple of other shows on the planets, deep space programs as well. So all of those are available uh, in the same format as this show on our LSC in the house page. So, Mariella is wondering how long before humans can live our vacation on Mars. Well, yet, it, this has been a moving target in terms of when humans can get to Mars. So we really had hoped uh, 30 years ago to have people on Mars by now, by 2020. But again, space is a real challenge. Getting to space is a challenge. The technology of getting to a distant planet is such a challenge that it's probably going to be the 2040s is what it's looking right at right now. I mean, certainly a lot of great technology is being pressed into service by private industry, by NASA, and as we've seen in the show, by other nations. So that's going to really help in terms of all the different efforts to, to get at the issue of how you can get someone to Mars safely and then get them back as well. But I'm thinking, yeah, we're talking at least 25 years is my best guess. So I think most of the questions that have come up have been covered in the chat. So with that, I wanted to go ahead and thank you all for joining us and thank you for our team behind the scenes, uh, Jeremy and Andrew and Krista for helping this go smoothly. And uh, come back and see us for Krista's presentation at five o'clock on the 4th of March on the future of human spaceflight, building again on this idea of getting back to Mars as well as getting back to the moon. 
Uh, for those that you know, we're joining us tonight at 7 o'clock for the Valentine's Day trivia. And we're hoping we'll see some of you in situ. The same three people who do all of these shows online are also there giving the shows in our planetarium. Uh, if you want to go see our shows, as I mentioned at the start, get reservations online. Uh, we're happy to announce that our shows have been filling up pretty consistently. So that is it. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you back here either at 7 o'clock tonight or on March 4 for our next Planetarium Online program. Thank you, everybody.